some things to keep in mind. So if you were citing uh, Leotard as a postmodern condition, this would be an example of how you would do it. So in the first note, you would say uh, John Francois Leotard's comma. And then notice there's a space after the comma. And then the title, the postmodern condition, a report on knowledge. And the second part here, a report on knowledge, that is often called in English a subtitle. Um, and you can often leave it off. You can leave it out. So you at least want to write the Jean Francois Leotard comma space the postmodern condition. And remember, in English, book titles have to be in italics. Book titles have to be in italics. It looks really strange in English if you have a book title and it's not in italics. So uh, titles of articles or essays go in quotation marks. So I've written an essay. Um, Ethics and Confucianism, and if you were citing my article, you put the title in quotation marks, not italicized. But for a book title, it's got to be in italics. Then there's another space. The space is hard to see here because it happens to be the end of a line, but you need a space after the end of the title. Then you have a parenthesis. The place of publication, which in this case is Minneapolis, a city in the US, a colon, another space, the publisher, which in this case is University of Minnesota Press, a comma, a space, year of publication, parenthesis, comma, a space, and now P with a period after it, and that means what? A P with a period after it means page. In this case, it's page XXIV. And remember, there has to be a space in here, too. And you usually would leave these as lower case, as lower case. Why? Well, because that's how they are in the book. They're usually lower case. So that's how you would cite a book. Now, some of you noticed that there's something strange about the C in Leotard's name. He has an, it's a French name. He's from Canada, but he's from Quebec. And, and so it's a French name, Jean-Francois Leotard. And some of you noticed there's something strange about that C. Um, some of you thought, well, maybe it's a G, but it's not a G. No. It's, what it is, is it's a C with a little thing under it like that. And they have those in French. We don't have them in English. Often in English, you just leave it out. It's actually correct to have it in. And when I do notes, I actually put this weird symbol in. But you need to know how to find it on your computer. If you can't find it, it's not a big deal. I, the only reason I'm mentioning it is some of you saw it and thought, oh, that must be a G or something. But I'm glad you noticed there was something different. But it's, it's not that it's a G. It's that it's a C with a thing on it. Like, oh, is it a soup song? Is that what it's called? It ain't no French. I think it's called a soup song, but it's not important. Now, suppose you cited Leotard a second time in, a, in the next note. So suppose in the next note, you cite Leotard again. This time, you can just write Leotard, comma, space, postmodern condition. It's a jian chung, you're just abbreviating the title. Still has to be in italics. There's a titles of books in English in italics. A comma, a space, and look here is PP. Why is it PP? PP with a period equals pages. 
Now, why on earth does PP in English mean pages when there's only one P in English in the word pages? I don't know. Maybe there's some good reason for that. But ever since I was in grade school, I've known PP is pages. There's no reason you would know that, but that's the way it works in English. PP is pages. P is page. So here we wrote P period space XXIV for 24, page 24. Here it's PP period space 40 to 41 because we're referring to two pages. Now here's another book we might cite, Ludwig Wittgenstein, comma, space, philosophical investigations. That's the book that Leotard was quoting from. And I told you, you don't have to cite it. But some of you did, and that's fine. And this is how you cite it. First name, Ludwig. Last name, Wittgenstein. Comma, space. Title, in italics. Left parenthesis. Place of publication, Oxford. Colon. Publisher, Basil Blackwell. Close the parenthesis out. Comma, space. Period. Period. Oh, sorry. See, sorry. Should I say that twice? Comma, space, P. Period. Space, 5. Because we're only referring to page 5. Period. And then, if we wanted to refer to Leotard again, Leotard, postmodern condition, page 4. Right, so these could be, I should have numbered them to make it more clear. But these could be four notes in a, in a paper. These might be four notes in a paper. And this would be how you would format them. And try to get every detail right. And, and these are really small details, but they're the kind of thing that makes your English look much more natural and seem uh, much more sophisticated. Let me give you an example. In the first oral test, the first oral exam I ever had in Chinese, my teacher started out with a really easy example so that I wouldn't be nervous. My teacher said, Ni hao ma. And I said, Wuhan hao ma. <laughs> yeah. And so, like, what's wrong? Well, I stuck ma on the end. Right? It's a small mistake. It's a really small word. Right? But does that sound normal? No, it sounds really weird, right? It's like, you know, I'm fine, am I? You know, I guess it sounds like that. It would sound in English. It doesn't, that's weird. You don't say that in Chinese. It's a little difference, but... And so sometimes languages are like that. So these are things where if you leave the space out here, or if you uh, put a comma here, or if you only have one P or if you don't put postmodern condition in italics, it will look really strange in English. Whereas if you remember it, if you just do the format, people will say, oh, looks like this person really knows English well. Look how well he or she wrote the English. Now, I, I said in the lecture I gave about writing well and publishing in US academic journals that there are different formats you can use. And that's true. So, for example, you could say Jean Francois Leotard, the postmodern conditioner, report of knowledge, trans, meaning translator, funky, Jacques Bennington and Brian Masumi, because Leotard's the postmodern condition was originally written in French, and so it had to be translated. You don't always have to list the translator, especially if there's only one translation of the work. The only translation I know of for this book is by these guys. So you kind of don't need to mention it. But it is correct if you give the translator. And that's how you would do it. Trans, John Bennington and Brian Masumi, Minneapolis University of Minnesota Press, blah, blah, blah. You can also use an English image to refer back to a book that you just cited. And some of you used Ibid. You would obviously learn how to use Ibid. So Ibid means I'm referring to the book I just referred to in the previous note. The trend in uh, publishing now is 
to stop using Ibid. Ibid is used less and less now. So some of you used it, it's not wrong to use it, but I, I'm just warning you, the tendency, the trend, is to use it less, and it's actually hard to use correctly. There are a lot of complicated rules about using Ibid. I had to learn them in high school, and I still remember them, but you're better off if you don't have to know them. And you don't, because, as I say, most publishers will want your notes like this. The first time you cite a book, you give complete information. The second time, just like this. This is the first citation of Wittgenstein's book, so I give complete information. Then when I cite Leotard again, just partial information. If it's hard to use, so if it is used correctly here, then if I cited Wittgenstein, I would cite him like this. But suppose I wanted to refer to Leotard again. I can't use Ibid here, right? Why not? Ibid refers to the work you just cited. So I have to do something else. Or what if I wanted to refer to back to this book, but the exact same page? So there are all these rules you have to remember about Ibid. So I'd say, you know, you can use it if you want to, but it's really complicated. And again, if you want, if you're not sure what to do, the Chicago Manual of Style, which is a physical book, it's a, it's a thick book, I have it on my shelf at home, has all the information you could ever want. It must be in the library. It must. And they have a basic guide online. If you just go to HTTP uh, colon slash slash www.chicagomanualofstyle.org. The, the rest of it, you can get to, once you get to the main web page, you can get to the, you'll know how to get to the basic citation formats. And that will give you basic formats for really basic things. You need them. So, but if you need detailed information, you got to get the book itself. Or some libraries, my school library, and maybe the Uda library, have a subscription to the online version so that on campus you can use the online version. Maybe you have one, I don't know. But at least I will guarantee the Uda library has a copy of it. If it doesn't have a copy of the Chicago Manual Style, email me and I will get one from the library. That will be my gift to the Uda library. Now suppose you don't have to read all of this, don't panic. Don't panic, you're not going to read all of it. I mean, you're going to read it, but not now. Because it's part of next week's reading. Um, but um, I'll just give you an example. Suppose we wanted to cite or quote this sentence that's underlined here. Now, in the reading for next week from Davidson's essay on the very idea of a conceptual scheme, it's taken from a book, but it's formatted a little differently from the book. So you will find in your version of the article things where it says end page 183. What does that mean? It means everything above that line is part of page 183. Everything above below that line is part of page 184. Right? So this end page 183 here, it means this is the end of page 183, so 183 goes out that way, and that must mean that 184 goes down this way. So suppose we want to cite this sentence. We want to quote this sentence. Now, how are we going to do it? Well, we do it like this. Davidson claims that quotation marks, and notice there's a space in front of the quotation marks but there's no space after the quotation mark. The word comes next. Again, it's a little thing, but it looks really strange in English if you put a space to the right of the quotation marks. Davidson claims that, quote, languages that have evolved in distant times or places may differ extensively in their resources for dealing with one or another range of them. Period, uh, quotation marks, and footnote numbers. The footnote number goes to the right of everything else. It doesn't matter what you have in the sentence. The footnote number is to the right of it. 
You could have a parenthesis. You could have an exclamation point. You could have quotation marks. Put that footnote number all the way out to the right. All the way out there. Again, it looks really strange in English if you put it anywhere else. Here's another sentence. As examples of, quote, languages that have evolved in distant times or places, comma, quotation marks, footnote number two, we may consider Chinese and English. Again, footnote mark goes to the right of all other punctuation. Now, what do these numbers go with? Number one would go with Donald Davidson, comma, space, quotation marks, because it's like, remember I, I was talking about science, it's like that, up there, on the very idea of a conceptual scheme, comma, quotation marks, in inquiries into truth and interpretation. That's the collection of essays by Davidson that includes this essay. In Inquiries into Truth and Interpretation, comma, space, 2ND. 2ND is an abbreviation that stands for second. Second. And of course, second ED period means second edition. Second edition. Space, left parenthesis, Oxford, colon, space, Clarendon Press, comma, space, 2001, parenthesis, comma, space. Remember, these P's are lowercase, lowercase. P period, space, 183 to 184. Got to be PP because we're, we're citing more than one page. Then the second note. That phrase, languages that have evolved in distant times or places, let's go back and look. Languages that have evolved in distant times or places. Languages that, I think I said different. We'll see what I said. Languages that have evolved in distant times or places. End page 183, so this is all still on page 183. Oh, I got it right. Languages that have evolved in distant times or places, too, this is all on page 183. And since it's the second citation, it's Davidson, comma, quotation marks, and you can abbreviate the title, Jen Chung, you can abbreviate the title on the very idea. You could also write the full title if you wanted to, but abbreviate is fine. On the very idea, comma, quotations, space, P, period, space, 183, period. And again, the, it's only a P here because we're citing one page, one page. Really tiny things I know, but again, they make your, your English seem much more uh, accurate and scholarly and real. The important thing, of course, is content. So for most of the course, I've just stressed, well, do you understand the ideas? Do you have the big ideas? But it is also an English course. So I, I would not be doing my job if I didn't make sure you also do these kind of things about how the site works. So, you one last chance to look at that. Now, something else, and remember, just another reminder, avoid run-on sentences. Avoid run-on sentences. Okay, I know uh, it's just a convention. It's, it's a good example of the differences in language games. The differences in language games. Because part of Chinese is run-on sentences are not a problem. They're just how you write. It's part of how you write. English, though, it's a mistake if you do it. Why? Does that mean English is right? No, of course not. But it's just good writers in English say you can't do that. So he refuses to give a definition of language games, perhaps for comma. Perhaps for Wittgenstein, comma, a definition would be too restrictive. Incorrect. Why? There's two separate sentences here, and they're joined by a comma. What are the two separate sentences? He refuses to give a definition of language games. And if we put a semicolon here, now it's OK. Except the semicolon can separate two sentences. The second sentence is, perhaps for Wittgenstein, comma, a definition would be too restrictive. That is correct. That, that is correct. 
or just use a period and a capital letter. He refuses to give a definition of language names, period, capital letter P. Perhaps for Wittgenstein, a definition would be too restrictive. Also correct. There are things a lot to take on, like pick it up, but once you pick it up, like, oh yeah, you can't, you can't do that. Here's one more example. There are two kinds of meta-narratives, comma, the narratives of speculation and emancipation, comma. An example of the former is German classical idealism. Incorrect. But why? There are two kinds of meta-narratives, comma, the narratives of speculation and emancipation, period, because that's a complete sentence. Start the next sentence with a capital letter. An example of the former is German classical idealism. That's correct. That's perfectly correct. Uh, you could also use a semicolon here. I think it reads a little better with a period, but it's not wrong. Yeah, that's fine with a semicolon too. Semicolon is fine too. Okay. So, Again, yeah, little bitty things, but it is also a language course, so I want to make sure you can learn that. So for next week, um, I'm going to give you some flexibility in what you have to read for next week. So for next week, if you have been struggling a little bit with the reading, if the reading has been a little hard, and you know you would like something a bit more manageable then all you have to read, the minimum you have to read for next week, is my thing, B.W. Van Orden, on the very idea of understanding Davidson, which is about 11 pages long. And it's on the QQ uh, group. And the title is actually a very small joke. When Davidson, when Davidson's title is on the, very under, on the very idea of conceptual scheme, and my title is on the very idea of understanding Davidson because a guy not understanding Davidson because he's so hard. So if you, if, you, if, you, if you say, well, I don't have a lot of time to prepare this, it's taking me a lot of time to do these readings, these have been very hard readings, the minimum you have to do is just do that, and you will have been prepared for, for the next week. The moderate amount of reading, the amount of reading I wanted you to do originally on the syllabus was to read my On the Very Idea of Understanding Davidson and Donald Davidson on the very idea of a conceptual scheme. So I, I'd like it if you were able to read these both, but again, if you're feeling a bit overwhelmed, if you're feeling like this is a little bit too much, you can just read my, my piece, which is an explanation of Davidson's article. But of course, it's better if you can actually read Davidson's article, which is what I'm explaining, because then you can decide for yourself whether I've explained it well or things like that. If you're really ambitious, if you're like, well, no, I want to, I want to have it all. I want to, I want to read it all. Okay, all right, great, awesome. Read my explanation. Read Davidson. And when I teach a a course of the, when I teach this as a as a seminar, um, when I have, you know, we're going through material more quickly because all the the students are native speakers of English. Then I usually also have students read this essay by. W.V.O. Quine, W.V.O. stands for uh, Willard Van Orman, which is a very interesting name. Uh, but people just call him W.V.O. Quine, Two Dogmas of Empiricism, very famous essay in Western philosophy. And again, it's on the, it's on the QQ group. And in Richard Rorty's book, Philosophy in the Mirror of Nature, pages, so you notice PP, period of space, 192 to 209, comma, 221 to 230, comma, space, 299 to 311, period. So, uh, and notice, title, italicized, philosophy in the mirror of nature. So, if you're really ambitious, you can read all of these things, and they all relate to each other. And uh, Quine's article influenced Davidson, and Rory is commenting on Davidson, and I'm trying to explain Davidson, so they all fit together. But that's that's hard. That's a lot to read. So um, all the minimum is what you have to read. This is what I hoped you would read. This is a lot, but if, if you're ambitious, you can read all that. All right. So back to our friend Leotard. Um, so we're looking now. We looked at the uh, introduction, and I'm going to review a little bit because I went over some things a little fast at the end of the last class. But 
So we're going to talk about the section nine of the postmodern condition on narratives of the legitimation of knowledge. So narratives of the legitimation of knowledge. And just to review really quickly, Leotard says in the introduction, I will use the term modern to designate any science that legitimates itself with reference to a metadiscourse. And he's using the word science in a very broad way. So he's using science in a broad way, not just, uh, it's not just Zuhran uh, Kushman. Uh, you know, it could also be like social science, or even uh, philosophy, or literature, or religious studies, insofar as they think of themselves as giving knowledge. So Leotard is using science in a very broad sense. It's not just Zoranka. I will use the term modern to designate any science that legitimates itself as reference to a meta discourse. In other words, modernism is belief in a higher level theory that justifies a first order theory. Like for example, Russell's theory of knowledge in Problems of Philosophy, if it were true, would justify scientific knowledge. The covering law model of science, if it were true, would justify natural science. Then Lantard says, I define postmodern as incredulity towards meta Incredulity means disbelief. So postmodernism is disbelief in any higher level theory that would justify a first order theory. So a postmodernist is somebody who says, well, there are these things like science, or physics, or economics, or philosophy, or comparative literature, and they have their theories, but I don't believe the postmodernist says any story about why I should believe in these stories. And Lampard suggests that there are two major meta-narratives in the modern era. He says there's really two major stories people have told about why we should believe things like science, or why we should believe in certain kinds of institutions. And he says the first is the meta-narrative of emancipation. The subject of the first of these versions is humanity as the hero of liberty. The other one is speculation. And he says one, <clears throat> one may be tempted to reduce this entire approach, sorry, one may be tempted to reduce this entire approach to the politics of the scientific institution to the famous dictum, science for its own sake. That's a hard sentence, like many sentences in Lampard are. I always get stuck on it. One thing to keep in mind is, one may be tempted to reduce this entire approach to the politics of the scientific institution. That phrase goes together. So he says, one may be tempted to reduce this entire approach to the politics of the scientific institution to the famous dictum, science for its own sake. So he says these are the two major narratives. One of them is about humans as a whole becoming free. The other one is about science for its own sake. First, let's look at the meta narrative of emancipation. The basic idea of the meta narrative of emancipation is that in pre modern society, knowledge was denied to people by, for example, priests and tyrants. So the idea is that. In the old bad society, the, the priests and the ministers and the, the bishops and all the religious people, or the, uh, or the monks and the nuns and the tyrants, the kings and the queens and the dictators, they deny knowledge to the common people. And due to lack of knowledge, people could not effectively exercise freedom to make intelligent choices, because if you don't have knowledge, how can you make an intelligent free choice? You can make a choice, but it can't be a smart choice if you don't have knowledge. Now, if the people are ignorant, that's going to lead to superstition. Um, it's also going to give an excuse for those who are powerful to exercise power over the people. Because they'll say, well, look how stupid the people are. 
Look what stupid mistakes the people make. We have to govern them. You can't trust the people to make their own decisions. And in the meta narrative of emancipation, it says, well, the reason people make bad choices is because they don't have knowledge. If they were given knowledge, they could make good choices. So if you look at things like the May 4th movement in China, you know, people like Hu Xiu or Lu Xun, they were very influenced by the meta narrative of emancipation. They didn't call it that. But in criticizing traditional Chinese culture, what people like Hu Xiu and Lu Xun, a lot of what they were talking about was they were saying, look, people in our society have been kept ignorant. Because they're kept ignorant, they make superstitious choices, but their ignorance is also an excuse for uh, the Huang Di and the, the, uh, and the, uh, or the Ruja to make decisions for them. Like, well, you, you got to make decisions for the people, they can't make them for themselves. So that's the basic idea of the meta narrative of emancipation. Now, We'll return to this in a bit, but uh, Leotard has this classic Leotard sentence. And by a classic Leotard sentence, I mean it's a good point, but he phrases it in a way that's really hard to understand. I wish he would write more clearly. Um, he says, the only role positive knowledge can play is to inform the practical subject about the reality within which the execution of the prescription is to be inscribed. It allows the subject to circumscribe the executor, or what it is possible to do. But the executory, what should be done, is not within the purview of positive knowledge. It is one thing for an undertaking to be possible and another for it to be just. I'm tempted to go through that phrase by phrase and decode it for you, to translate it into ordinary uh, phrases for you. Uh, but the key idea here is the final sentence. It is one thing for an undertaking, an action, a policy, something you do, to be possible and another for it to be just. Just because you know how to do something, just because it's possible to do something, doesn't mean it's right. It doesn't mean it's just. And he's saying, what he's saying in the first part is, the only thing knowledge can tell you is, this is possible. Knowledge can tell you this is possible. Knowledge can tell you you could do this. But it won't tell you whether it's just. So that's a limitation of the uh, emancipatory story. Because you say, well, we want the people to be free, and we're going to make them free by giving them knowledge. But then we say, well, but if they have knowledge, will they really choose what is just or what is fair? There's an old saying in the Christian tradition. It goes back to the, um, the, the Bible. Uh, I think it's the New Testament. Um, the truth shall set you free. The truth shall set you free. It's a very inspiring line, but so how, and there's something about it that's right. If you know the truth, you're better able to make choices. But what Leotard is saying is, yes, you're better able to make choices if you're free, but will they be just choices? Will they be good choices? So according to the narrative of emancipation, knowledge is important because it informs the free citizen of what is possible, and thereby allows the citizen to use his or her own reasoning in government. However, Knowing what we can do does not tell us what we should do. This raises the question of how it is possible in a postmodern context to distinguish between justice and injustice, since knowledge won't tell you by itself what that is. Now, one of the most seminal, one of the most important, influential essays in the history of the Enlightenment narrative is Kant's essay, What is Enlightenment, which was published in 
1787. And I'm just going to quote a few phrases from it because it's very, very influential. And people continue in, to discuss it and debate it. And some people love it, and some people actually hate it. Um, some people think it doesn't go far enough in the direction of freedom. So Cox says in this essay, have the courage to use your own reason. This is the motto of enlightenment. If I have a book which understands for me, a pastor who has a conscience for me, a physician who decides my diet and so forth, I need not trouble myself. I need not, I need not think if I can only pay. Others will readily understate, undertake the irksome work of thinking for me. So, the first part we understand, have the courage to use your own reason. This is the model of life. Pretty clear, I think, what he's saying. What he's saying in the next part is it's a little bit ironic. The second part is a little bit ironic. He's not saying you should do these things in the second part. But he's saying they're very tempting to do. Like what? Well, if I have a book which understands them. So suppose I'm trying to figure something out, and I say, well, let me just look up a book that will tell me what I should think about this. So um, my, uh, I love uh, my late father very much, and he was a very hardworking and very great man. Uh, I disagree with him about politics sometimes, and uh, sometimes he would just get political books, and I think he would just read them and just believe whatever they said. Now, when he said, uh, the books would say things like, uh, oh, the U.S. government is full of communists, and we have to fight the communists. And so my father would say, oh, yeah, everybody who's a all the Democrats, like Obama, they're communists. Right? Um, my father didn't live to see Obama like the president, but he would have called him a communist, I'm sure. No doubt. Everybody who was not a Republican, my father thought, was a communist. They're all an algebra. They're all exactly the same now. And I'm not criticizing Mao, I'm just saying, my father's view, you're either a Republican or everybody's father. So my father, I love him, great man, hard working, did a wonderful job, I think, raising us. But he was like this. He would get a book and just like, tell me how to think. Tell me what to believe. So Kant says, if I have a book which understands for me, I have a pastor, a minister, a priest, a monk, a nun, who has a conscience for me. In other words, I'm trying to figure out what's right and what's wrong. Oh, I'll ask the minister. I'll ask the priest. They can tell me. They'll have a conscience for me. You know, their word will be on shin. Comments for Tasha will be on shin. And may have said that. If I have a physician who decides my diet. Uh, my mother, towards the end of her life, I love my parents, but uh, disagreed with them about some things. My mother, towards the end of her life, had some medical problems. She would go to the doctor, and the doctor would say, well, we could do this treatment, or we could do that treatment. And my mother would be so frustrated, she'd say, well, tell me what treatment I should get. What am I paying you for? Tell me what treatment I'm supposed to get. And I said, Mom, he's giving you a free choice. He wants you to understand that there are these reasons for doing this, and these reasons for doing that, but you have to decide what the right choice is. But my mother was old school. She said, he's a doctor. What are we paying him for? Tell me what to do. And the cop says, so if you have a physician who decides your diet, your medical treatment, and so forth, I need not trouble myself. What does that mean, I need not trouble myself? It means don't worry about it. Don't think about it. You know, don't agonize over it. I need not think if I can only pay it. Others will readily undertake the irksome, the difficult, the painful work of thinking for me. So Kant is not saying in this part, do that. He's saying, isn't it tempting to do that? Don't people often do this? But Kant's saying, don't do that. Kant's saying, have the courage to use your own reason. Don't listen to the book just because it's a book. Don't listen to your doctor just because she's a doctor. Don't listen to your minister or your priest just because they're a minister or a priest. Think for yourself. And then Kant says, for this enlightenment, for people to think for themselves, however, nothing is required but freedom. And indeed, the most harmless among all the things 
to which this term, freedom, can properly be applied. It is freedom to make public use of one's reason at every point. But I hear on all sides, do not argue. The officer says, he means like a military officer, right? So you're college students, you've had military training. So uh, the officer says, do not argue, but drill. The tax collector, do not argue, but pay. The cleric, pastor, minister, priest, do not argue, but believe. So Kant says we need freedom. Um, and the freedom is to use your reason, but he says, I hear everybody telling me not to argue, not to use my reason. He says, everywhere there is restriction on freedom. Now, which restriction is an obstacle to enlightenment, and which is not an obstacle, but a promoter of it? I answer, the public use of one's reason must always be free, and it alone can bring about enlightenment among men. So, the Kant claims, what he means by the public use of reason is, the right to argue however you wish, about whatever you wish, in public forums, must be free and unconstrained. So Kant is saying, and he's right in the late 18th century, he's in the late 1700s, he's saying that human beings have a natural right to argue about whatever they want, whatever way they want, in public forums. That's what he means by the public use of reason. However, remember we started this by saying, Which restriction on freedom is an obstacle to enlightenment and which is not an obstacle but a promoter? It says the public use of reason is the one that is a promoter of freedom. Contrast, Kant argues that the private use of reason must be restricted. By the private use of reason, Kant means that what one says and argues in one's official responsibilities as a soldier, as a police officer, as a minister or a priest, etc., that is not free. What does that mean? What it means is, um, for example, suppose um, I'm a soldier in the Vietnam War, the, what we call in the U.S. the Vietnam War, the, the war the U.S. fought with, with Vietnam. Um, and Kant would say, you have a, a right, American soldier, in your public use of reason to, the, to argue against the war. You have a right to argue in editorials and to send a letter to the president and to say in public, I think this is a stupid war. But the private use of reason, if I'm, a, if I'm an officer in the war, because I have a duty as an officer, my job is to say, we will capture that hill. We must win this battle. We must fight. Why? I have an obligation based on my status as an officer. I have to do what my duty requires. Likewise, really quickly, uh, I think I mentioned this last time, uh, I was chair of the philosophy department at my school. I have, we, all, we take a three-year term as chair, and nobody wants to be chair. It's not a fun job. And, this is exactly, to me, this sounds very true. Why? In department meetings, I would say things like, this should be our policy, this should be our rule, we should do this. And then we take a vote. And usually I lose. And then people would say, no, this is our policy. Well, now I'm chair. So when a student comes to me and says, I want to do this, I have to say to the student, no. That's not our policy. I can't say, you're right, it's a stupid rule, isn't it? I'm going to let you not follow the rule because I think it's dumb. The concept that's not right. In your public use of reason, which is arguing with your colleagues, say whatever you want. In your private use of reason, which is doing your job as chair, you say what you're supposed to as chair. You can even say, write a letter to the school newspaper and say, we got this policy that I think is stupid. But when the student comes to my office, i got to say, We'll take a quick break from the social shop, and then we'll continue.
So the meta narrative of speculation says this is the job of philosophy. Philosophy has to restore unity to all the different disciplines. Philosophy has to link them all together. So, in other words, the speculative meta narrative claims that genuine knowledge must be one part of a unified system of belief. It has to be encyclopedic, part of a university. So we're at a university in Bashir, right? In English, a university, una means one. And in a uh, British university. Yeah, yeah. Now, yes, like, yeah, it's, it means one. And so we call it a university, uh, but it's often very diverse. Right? There are different people, there are different majors, different schools, and I don't know whether this is true at Uda. I don't know Uda well enough yet, but I know at my school, what a shred you at, in my school, a problem we have is that we keep having new departments and new programs. It seems like every year there's a new department and a new program, there's a new field. We just established a department of uh, cognitive science. Um, and there's, just, there's a new one every day. And if we ask, what, how do all these different departments and these different programs, how do they fit together? The answer is, we don't have an answer. We don't know how they all fit together. It just, and so this frustrates me at my school. People come to the faculty and they say, we want to create a new department, or we want to create a new program. So for example, maybe suppose we, we now have an Asian studies We have an Asian studies program at my school. And I'm opposed to the Asian studies program. Why? Is that because I don't like Asia? I, I certainly like the China part of Asia. I actually kind of like India too. I like Japan. I like Korea. I like lots of parts of Asia. Um, so why don't why don't I approve? Why don't I agree with the Asian studies program? Because I asked. What is it supposed to do? How does it educate students to have a program that studies all of Asia? Right? Asia is China, Korea, Japan, India. Uh, it's also Afghanistan, the islands in the Pacific. That's Asia. Right? That's not a thing. But it was approved. Why? People don't have any idea of what a unit diversity is. There's just the diversity. There's just different things. So but the speculative narrative claims that genuine knowledge must be part of a unified system of belief. And two, proven to be true according to a universal methodology. And what I'm saying is the fact that my school all we have is more and more and more majors, and more and more and more programs, and nobody knows why. And when I ask people, why are we doing this? People just look at me like I'm annoying. You see, Brian, they don't say this, but you can tell they're thinking, stop asking hard questions. Stop asking questions we don't know how to answer. My question is, why are we doing this? And the meta narrative of speculation says there should be an answer. The answer is there is a unified system of belief. So you should explain why chemistry or biology or economics or political science or religious studies fits into this unified system of belief. And knowledge has to be proven to be true according to a universal methodology. Russell's conception of knowledge in problems of philosophy meets all three criteria. If Russell is right, we've got a, a, spe a speculative meta narrative that's perfect.
Kuhn and Leotard deny all three. Kuhn and Leotard deny there's a unified system of belief that it can be proven to be true according to a universal methodology. Now, in passing, Leotard makes a really, what I thought was a really interesting question about Marxism. He says, uh, it would be easy to show that Marxism has wavered between the two models of narrative legitimation I've just described. The party takes the place of the university. The proletariat, that of the people, or of humanity. Dialectical materialism, that of speculative idealism, etc. And I think there's something plausible about this. So here's two ways you can understand Marxism. I know there are other ways. But I'm just saying there's some point he's making that's interesting. So one way you can understand Marxism is you could say, well, it's part of a speculative meta-narrative. You could say, Marxism is the scientific materialist theory that comprehensively explains the inevitable development of history through the economic relationships of social classes. And when you read a work like Das Kapital, that seems to be what Marx is doing. It seems like this is the scientific comprehensive theory that will explain everything. And so it's an example of a theory which is supported by a speculative meta-narrative at that point. Marxism becomes an example of a narrative that is part of a speculative, supported by a speculative meta-narrative. However, and this is more common among Western Marxists, this is more common among Western Marxists, they tend to think, they tend to see Marx as part of an emancipatory meta-narrative. They say, Marxism explains why humans are alienated, that is to say, unfree in capitalist societies, and why complete freedom is only possible in a communist society. And I think you see this kind of view in the economic and philosophic manuscripts of 1844. Really interesting work by Marx, if you haven't already read it. Um, and if you haven't read the economic and philosophic manuscripts of 1844, why haven't you? Is it because you have a book that thinks for you? What does Kant say? Kant says, you don't have to think if you have a book that thinks for you. So if you have a book that tells you what Marx thinks, then you don't need to think for yourself about what Marx thinks. But you might want to see, well, what does Marx himself say? And I think that's one of Marx's most interesting writings, I think. So, so I think there's some possibility that. that you, you could construe Marxism according to either a speculative or an emancipatory narrative. Next section, delegitimation. Uh, the background here, the background image, this is from American artist Jackson Pollock's, one of his paintings. Jackson Pollock was very famous for his very abstract paintings. As you can see, it's extremely abstract. It's basically just like paint thrown on a canvas. He was very big in the 50s. So Leonard says the grand narrative, the meta narratives, have law and credibility, regardless of what mode of unification it uses, regardless of whether it's a speculative narrative or a narrative of emancipation. So how is the speculative meta narrative undermined? Well, Leonard says the speculative apparatus maintains an ambiguous relation to knowledge. It shows that knowledge is only worthy of that name to the extent that it reduplicates itself, lifts itself up, helps it out, it's a German phrase, is sublated by citing its own statements in a second level discourse, autonomy, that functions to legitimate. Again, Good point, phrased really unclearly. Wish you were more clearly. So, what he's saying is, to put it in different terms, according to the speculative meta narrative, claims count as knowledge only if they are justified by some meta narrative that proves that they are justified. For example, the physics narrative states that oxygen has seven electrons. I think that's right. If I'm wrong, correct me. I meant to double check. My memory is oxygen has seven electrons. So the physics narrative states that oxygen has seven electrons. A justified meta narrative might state the claim that oxygen has seven electrons is justified because dot dot dot, where dot 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 
might be the covering law model, which we, you know, we talked about before, the covering law model of science, or Russell's theory in problems of philosophy, for example. So, Leitard is saying that, and this is, this is probably right, isn't it? So if we say, if we ask a physicist, if we say, the physicist says, well, oxygen has seven electrons. And we say, well, do you know that? Say, well, of course I know that. Why? Well, here's my account of why scientific knowledge is justified. Here's my theory of why scientific knowledge is justified. It might be the covering law model, it might be Russell's view, but there's some kind of meta-narrative about this is how science works. Then Lantard says, we could say, in keeping with the perspective we adopted earlier, that this presupposition, namely that knowledge only counts as knowledge, if it's justified in a meta-narrative, defines the set of rules one must accept in order to play the speculative game. There thus arises an idea of perspective that is not far removed, at least in this respect, from the idea of language games. So in other words, what we're saying is, it doesn't count as knowledge unless it has a meta-narrative that justifies it. But one way you could talk about that is you could say, so in other words, part of the rules of conducting science are that you have to follow the scientific method, or you have to follow a certain method of justification, or else it's not science. And that's like the notion of a language game, which we talked about in previous classes. Then Lantard says, but once you say, okay, according to science, something is only knowledge if it satisfies the scientific method, or the current law model, or Russell's theory, or something like that. And then you realize, so science is defined by following a particular kind of rule. And so it's kind of like a language game. Then you realize science plays its own game. It is incapable of legitimating the other language games. The game of prescription, for example, the game of right and wrong, just and unjust, escapes it. But above, all, but above all, it is incapable of legitimating itself as speculation assumed it could. The sciences owe their status to the existence of a language whose rules of function cannot themselves be demonstrated, but are the objects of a consensus among experts. Let's just review a little bit about language games. Um, there's no justification for the rules of, say, Chinese chess, Zhongguo uh, Shanxi, um, or uh, poker, hookah, uh, or soccer, zucho, beyond this is the rule. You might tell a story about how that got to be the rule, historically, but there's no further justification beyond, well, that's how you play the game. Furthermore, it would be a mistake to try to apply a rule of Western chess to Chinese chess. And so likewise, it's a mistake to try to apply a rule of one language game to another language game. So each game has its own rules, and we can't justify the rules beyond a certain point. We just have to say that's the rule as far as it goes. So the rules of the scientific language game define and govern science, but do not define and govern, govern other language games. There's no justification for science beyond the consensus, the unforced agreement in the scientific community that this is how we do science currently. And if you say, well, but can't you prove in science that what science claims is true, Lampard says in passing, the question of proof is problematical since proof needs to be proven. Do you guys know if I mentioned who Lewis Carroll, you know who Lewis Carroll was? He wrote uh, uh, Through the Looking Glass and Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. Oh, are those books not well known? Those are great books. Those are really good books, yeah. So, yeah. Um, Thanks. 
self-correcting the Lewis. Think of C A R R O L. Lewis and Carol, Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, and Frida Looking Glass. Two wonderful short books by Lewis Carroll. Lewis Carroll is his companion's uh, name, it's not his real name. His real name was the Reverend Luffridge Dodson. Um, but that's not crucial. Uh, they're, they're fantasy books, they're fun fantasy books, but they're also very, very clever. They're very, very clever fantasy books. And so you really, yeah, tell them they're fun reading. Um, you might want to get an annotated edition, an edition with footnotes. Some of his references are a little, he wrote these in the 19th century. So some of the English is a little old fashioned. So, but they're great books. The reason I mention them is in the West, Lewis Carroll is very famous for these books. He's a 19th century author, very famous for these books. But he was also a professor of mathematics and logic at Oxford. That was his real job. He was a professor of mathematics and logic at Oxford. And he also wrote some philosophical dialogues. And one of the philosophical dialogues that Lewis Carroll wrote um, was a dialogue between um, a, uh, Achilles, the, one of the heroes of Homer's Iliad, um, and a tortoise. Uh, and so a, a, a tortoise and a, an Achilles, one of the heroes of the Iliad, they had a dialogue. And what the dialogue is about is it's about proof. It's about proving things. And, and the point that Lewis Carroll makes is very similar to this point that Leotard makes. The question of proof is problematical since proof needs to be proven. So, for example, here's what, here's part of what the way the argument goes. Um, there's a couple of things to say. Suppose you have a really simple argument. So let P and Q are like variables, they're like standard sentences. Look at a really simple argument like if P then Q, P therefore Q. If it is Tuesday, then we will have class tonight. P, it is Tuesday, therefore Q, we will have class tonight. Really simple argument. And so in the dialogue, Achilles and Tortoise are talking, and I, th I, think, it's, uh, I think it's Achilles says, well, isn't this a really good argument? And the Tortoise says, well, it's not a good argument. But, but he says, how do you know that from this and that I can get to this conclusion? How do you know that from if P then Q and P I can get to Q? How do you know that if, if it's true that if P then Q and it's true that P, that therefore Q? And the tortoise, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, the, that the tortoise asks that and Achilles says, Achilles says, oh, well, you know, it's just a basic rule that if you have these first two things, let's call them P, then you can get to the second thing, we'll call that Q. But then the tortoise says, but wait a second, now don't I need another rule that tells me if I got this, I can get to this? And then the Achilles tries to give him another rule. And then the tortoise says, but now don't I need another rule that says that this is a case where I can apply that rule? And it keeps going on infinitely. And the conclusion is, at some point, you can't keep proving things. You just have to say, well, I don't know how to prove this any further. Now, that would be okay as long as people never question your assumptions. But the problem is people keep questioning your assumptions. And so proof is problematical because no matter how you try to prove something, your proof needs to be proven. And if you can't prove it, then you haven't really proven it. So what Leotard's claiming is, 
the rules of the scientific language game define and govern science, but they can't define and govern other language games. So I can, for example, say, if Leonhard is correct, um, that um, I can't, I, well, there's a bunch of ways you can apply this, but one way you can apply it is just because I know what the facts are, that doesn't tell me what's right and wrong. And just because I know what's right and wrong, that doesn't tell me I know what the facts are. Those are different language rules. And there's no way to justify science beyond the rules that it's got. So the Aristotelian scientist has the Aristotelian science rules, the Newtonian scientist has the Newtonian science rules, and the Einsteinian physics scientist has the Einsteinian rules. What about the emancipatory narrative? How is it under? He says, the potential for erosion intrinsic to the other legitimation procedure, the, emancip the emancipation apparatus flowing from the outflow, that's just a German word for the language, is no less extensive than the one at work within speculative discourse. Its distinguishing characteristic is that it grounds the legitimation of science and truth in the autonomy of interlocutors involved in ethical, social, and political practices. So all he's saying here is that in the case of the emancipatory narrative, it is grounded in the freedom of the people who are engaging in a dialogue. But, he says, there's nothing to prove that if a statement describing a real situation is true, it follows, a, it follows that a prescriptive statement based upon it, the effect of which will necessarily be a modification of that reality will be just. It's just that point we saw before, that just because you know that you took an action based on a true claim, that doesn't mean that the action will be just or fair or right. So the emancipatory narrative grounds justification in the freedom of the participants in a narrative constructed through dialogue. But even if the people act only on claims about the world that are true, this does not guarantee the justice of their actions. There are two further problems which he doesn't stress, but which other people have stressed. In addition, given the heterogeneity of language names, it seems unlikely that free interlocutors, free conversation partners, can reach agreement, can reach consensus. A lot of different language games, how are we going to reach agreement? Furthermore, Michel Foucault, a really interesting philosopher, French philosopher of the 20th century, Michel Foucault has raised doubts about what freedom means and whether we have actually become more free since the Enlightenment. And I have uh, a lot of examples uh, to illustrate this um, that I know work well in, in U.S. popular culture. I don't know how I don't know the examples work as well in popular culture. I know they work well in U.S. popular culture. But so, for example, um, and I hope this doesn't uh, offend, uh, but the one in, one of uh, Michel Foucault's, he's got well, he has several books that are very very interesting. But among his, uh, Michel Foucault's most interesting books are The History of Sexuality and Discipline and Punch. The History of Sexuality um, the first volume came out before he died. Uh, I think it's one of the most interesting volumes in, in it. I think this is the most interesting volume in the series, The History of Sexuality. Discipline and Punish uh, is about the prison system in the West and the development of the punishment, forms of punishment in the West, also a fascinating kind of work. Um, and on the series, I'll give you some examples. Uh, I hope you don't mind them. Uh, they're just the only example. The examples I use with my students a lot in the West. Um, 
So in the history of sexuality, one of the things says is he says, we have this story we tell ourselves. He doesn't call it a metaphor. But it is a meta-narrative, what Leonard Hart calls meta-narrative. So if we have the story we tell ourselves, what do we tell ourselves? The story we tell ourselves is that in the past, people were very sexually repressed. People were very afraid to express their sexuality. People were very afraid to be sexual. People were very constrained in how they could be sexual. Whereas now, in the contemporary West, we are really open sexually, and we're free sexually, and we're allowed to be however we want to be sexually. Foucault says that's the story we tell ourselves. It's a story about becoming increasingly free in regard to sexuality. Foucault says, nonsense. It's not true at all. How is it not true? And Foucault says, well, First of all, if you look back historically, people have been talking about sex a lot for centuries. And it goes back, he gives examples of people teaching sexual education to children in Europe, at least as far back as the 18th century, and encouraging children to talk about sexuality in a free and open way, and to use the anatomically correct terms for body parts, and to for you know, children to understand where babies come from. And he says, so this is not a new thing. We think we're more free today because oh, people, you know, kids know where babies come from. Kids do that you know, way back when. That's not a new thing. And he also says, and this is, I think, what's most interesting. He says, and, and again, I don't know whether this is true of China. You've got to decide for yourself. I can just say I think it, there's something very true about it in the US, which is, the ways in which people are sexually restrained have changed, but they're still sexually restrained. How so? Um, if I tell this to my students, and again, I have no idea whether this, if your experience is quite like this or not, but I tell my students, I said, suppose you were chatting in your dorm, right? chatting with your friends in your dorm, and somebody, and somehow the topic of sex comes up. And somebody says, yeah, I really don't like sex. What would your reaction be? And they kind of like people look around and giggle a little bit. And I'm like, uh, yeah, you, wouldn't your reaction be, you would think, what's wrong with that person? Why doesn't that person want sex? And if you were their friend, you'd probably say something later in private, like, hey, you know, did, have you considered therapy? about not liking sex? Is there, is there something you want to talk about? Is something, is something bad happening that made you not like sex? Right. Where if I said something like, I mean, I said in front of you, I said things like, I don't like soccer. Do not say, did you hear that word? Say you don't like soccer? What? That's messed up. Why doesn't he like soccer? Has he considered therapy? We're talking to a doctor so he can start liking soccer? But if you say, oh, I don't like sex, People think, you're messed up. What's wrong with you? Why don't you like sex? You're supposed to like sex. So Foucault is saying, he's saying, the ways in which people are controlled by society change, but they're, they're still controlled. It's just sometimes they tell them, you should have bought sex before you're married. Other times you're told, what's wrong with you if you don't want sex before you're married? Either way, you're controlled. You're just controlled in different ways. So, a clever point. Also, Foucault was gay. Foucault was homosexual. Now, whatever your personal beliefs about homosexuality, um, I hear that China's more open about being gay than the U.S. is, but I don't know. And your personal beliefs are your personal beliefs. That's not my job to tell you what to believe about it. Um, personally, I find nothing. If that's, your, if that's who you are, that's okay with me. But that's just my view. I'm not trying to push my view down the throat. But, but Foucault was gay. And so, but he had an interesting perspective on this. He said, well, suppose you're uh, gay in uh, a society. Well, he has a couple of interesting things to say. He has a lot of interesting things to say. He's really fascinating. Um, I thought I'd teach Foucault, too. Uh, Foucault gives, in one of his, in, just in History of Sexuality, Foucault gives the day, the day, 
he says, on which homosexuality was invented. Invented. Which are fa xian, which are fa men. What does he mean invented? That sounds crazy. And what does he mean discovered? It's like, surely people knew there were homosexual people as long as there have been people, right? I mean, you can't, like, people didn't know. It's like, because it's no. Homosexuality in the West was invented on a particular date when a particular doctor published an article that said there's a medical condition called homosexuality. Here's what it is. And he said at that point, everybody's like, okay, this is what it is to be gay. And if you're not gay, you think that's what it is to be gay. And if you are gay, you think that's what it is to be me. So Foucault's saying, you can't just say, well, there's just being gay. Foucault says, no, there's being gay or being homosexual given what your society tells you that means. And once a book says it's, an Ill, it's a mental illness, this is what it is, that defines it. But, again, we say, oh, well, nowadays in the U.S., most people don't think that being homosexual is a mental illness. Most doctors don't think it's a mental illness. But Foucault, he's smart, he said, yeah, but we're still under pressure to be gay the right way. Right? And I have friends who are gay, and they'll say this, they'll say sometimes it's like, if you say something, or you dress a certain way, or you act a certain way, they're like, what's wrong with you? You're gay. You're not supposed to act that way. Or you're not supposed to dress that way. You're not supposed to talk that way. You know, or you're not supposed to be that way. And it's like, well, you had to be gay a certain way, right? Or if you, it's the same thing for being straight, right? I mean, there's things like, if you do certain things and you're a straight guy, it's like, oh, yeah, that's kind of gay, dude. Dude, I don't know if you say this in the U.S. and say that in China. In the U.S., sometimes you'll say of a friend, you'll say, dude, kind of gay. You know, it's just like, you're not supposed to act that way if you're a straight guy, right? So what Foucault's saying is everything that we think we're free, we say, we tell ourselves these stories about, oh, I'm more free if this happens, or we're more free now than we were before because of this. But Foucault says we miss all the subtle ways that society controls us, even as we think we're becoming more free. Interesting point, so I would invite you to apply it and decide for yourself whether you think it's true. Maybe you don't. Maybe you just say, no, you know, I know in China we're more free than we were in the past, no question about it. Or are there ways in which you're less free in some ways, but it's more subtle, the way in which you're controlled? Because Foucault says a lot of the control on freedom is subtle things. If somebody puts a gun to your head and says, don't do that, you know you're not free. If everybody looks at you when you do something, or people you know, won't talk to you when you do something, it's subtle, but you're still not free. Or if you can't do something because you've been taught you can't do that, Foucault says you're still not free. And something to think about. So the conclusion of this section, so most people have lost the nostalgia for the lost narrative. It in no way follows they were reduced to barbarity. What saves them from it is their knowledge that legitimation can only spring from their own linguistic practice and communicational interaction. <coughs> Lays our hints here at the solution to the problem of how to preserve concepts of justice and justice in a postmodern age. He will try to get notions of justice and injustice out of concepts of linguistic practice, language games, and communicational interaction, discussion and innovation without terror. So that's where he's going to be going. Um, so let's just make sure we see where we're going here. So, so Russell gave us a modernist view of how knowledge could be possible which had a meta-narrative, basically Russell was giving us a meta-narrative of how knowledge was learning. We read it to Kuhn. Kuhn gives a very detailed account of how science develops. And part of the point of that account was to say an account like Russell's isn't plausible. There aren't things that we know intuitively the way Russell thinks we know things intuitively. Leotard is fully embracing postmodernism and using Wittgenstein's notion of a language game to formulate it. And, and so he's basically saying of things like science, science is just one kind of language game, and no language game can ultimately justify itself. So, and he doesn't specifically say this, but we can apply it to what Kuhn says. 
There's the Aristotelian language game, the Galilean language game, the Newtonian language game, the Einsteinian language game. And so each one has its own rules and its own practices. It's a mistake to apply the rules of one language game to another language game. They're just different games. Now this section of research and its legitimation through performativity is actually pretty interesting. I'm going to just say a couple of things about it that's actually very clever. Leopard says, since performativity, now what's performativity? This is a word he's used before. Performativity means something like efficiency. It's the ability to do a lot with a small input. So you maximize performativity if, you, if you're able to produce more, to do more, to get more. Since performativity increases the ability to produce proof, it also increases the ability to be right. The technical criteria introduced on a massive scale into scientific knowledge cannot fail to influence the truth criteria. Again, complicated sentence, easy to just get frustrated and give up, but the, the point he's making is really fast. The point he's making is, if <coughs> you are really good at, you have really good technology, you get better at proving things. Why? Scientific experiments cost money. Research costs money. It requires equipment. It requires time. It requires, if it's chemistry, chemicals. The chemists at my, my school are always saying we need money for chemicals. Um, they need resources. They need equipment. You might need to conduct surveys. If you have those resources, you can conduct research, and the research can be used to support your view. If you disagree with that view, you might fund research against it. But that depends on whether you can get the money to fund the research. Let me give you an example. Um, you know there are a lot of deaths in the United States because of uh, handguns and other kinds of guns. Much, I mean, I think it's next to impossible to get a gun in China unless you're in the army or police officer as far as I know. Um, in the U.S., much easier, much easier to get. I actually shot a machine gun. No, I don't own one, but I was in Vegas. I was on vacation. You can go into a store and shoot a machine gun. So I shot a machine gun. I don't know. Um, I also hurt my wrist once. I was shooting a, there's an Israeli pistol called a Desert Eagle. It's a 50 caliber pistol. If you don't know anything about guns, that's huge. That's way bigger than any ordinary pistol. I shot it. I burned my wrist. It's never recovered. It's how powerful. It was awesome. But anyway, a um, lot of fun. But so you, in the US, you, much easier access to pistols, rifles, shotguns. A lot more deaths in the US due to <laughs> pistols, rifles, shotguns, right? Surprise, surprise. When U.S. government agencies try to do research into the causes of violence due to handguns and rifles, conservative members of the U.S. Congress cut the funding to the research. You see what I'm saying? When the people who support the right to own weapons in the U.S. are generally right-wing, they're generally conservative. When U.S. government agencies started to research why is so much gun violence happening? How do we stop the gun violence? The conservatives said, we're removing the funding. Why? We don't want them to prove that. But if somebody wants to do research about how good guns are, they'll fund that. So Leotard is making a very clever point, which is, if you've got the money, then you can afford the technology, and then you can perform the experiments and do the research that will support your conclusions. And if you don't like the conclusions, you stop funding the research. Research funds are allocated by states, corporations, and nationalized companies in accordance with this logic of power growth. Research sectors that are unable to argue that they contribute even indirectly to the optimization of the system's performance are abandoned by the flow of capital due to senescence. Senescence means gradual death. 
So research sectors have to be able to argue that they somehow contribute to a system's performance, to its efficiency. And for example, when people ask me what I teach, I say I teach philosophy, specifically Chinese philosophy. And a lot of times people will say, well, Vassar, you have a lot, that's my school, you have a lot of rich students there. I guess they could study anything. I guess they don't have to worry about getting a job. And I always say, well, no, 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 no. I mean, I think it's very valuable to study uh, Chinese philosophy because China's so important, it's going to only be more and more important in the future. Philosophy is very valuable. Philosophy majors do well when they go to law school. Philosophy majors do well when they go to medical school. They're philosophy majors who become rich business people. That's how I end up justifying philosophy. I say it's just like why you can get a good job, and what we need to understand China, China's really important, so we gotta study Chinese philosophy. Performativity becomes the only criterion for judging anything. I have to justify what I'm doing in terms of performativity. Okay, we'll take, we'll take a quick break, uh, and then we'll continue. Let me show you some shot. <laughs> by 
the decisions that were made to do certain kinds of research. That's a very extreme claim. But the basic idea that you can get to new truths because you have new technology, that seems exactly right. Because you have new technology, you can prove things you couldn't prove before. And to have that technology, you need money. So if you want to have new technology, if you want to discover something about the moon, and you want to send a probe to the moon, like China just did, you got to spend money right, to develop the technology to send it. But once you've done that, you have the technology, and now you can discover new truths about the moon. So he says, the games of scientific language become the games of the rich, in which whoever is wealthiest has the best chance of being right. An equation between wealth, efficiency, and truth is thus established. You know, something to that. So he seems to be suggesting a very radical claim, a very extreme claim, which is that truth just depends on money. Right? Like Pickering seems to be suggesting in his books that quarks basically just their existence just depends on how the research went. But even if that's too extreme, even if you say, well, that can't be right, that's crazy. The basic idea that to get it true, you need technology. To get technology, you need wealth. That's correct. It's a, I'm sure that China will discover all kinds of interesting things with the new probe on the moon. So there'll be new truths from the new probe on the moon. How is that possible? Technology. How is the technology possible? Wealth. The US discovered all kinds of things by sending a ship to the moon. So we got truths by sending the Apollo mission to the moon. How do we do that? Lots of new technology. How do we get the new technology? Wealth. And then, once you get the technology and the truth, you use it to produce more wealth and technology. So it becomes a circle. And if you're out of the circle, then you don't get more wealth and technology. So China's in the circle. All right, legitimation by the law of morality. So Lepard suggests consensus has become an outmoded and suspect value. But justice as a value is neither outmoded nor suspect. We must thus arrive at an idea and practice of justice that is not linked to that consensus. So what is Leotard's own conception of justice? He says, well, a recognition of the heteromorphous nature of language games. In other words, language games are of different kinds. Is a first step in that direction. Um, I thought of another example of this. One of my colleagues, um, uh, Uman Orion, bless you, is always pointing out, she's always saying, um, when people talk about arriving at a, a consensus through philosophical dialogue, my colleague is always saying, but that's not always the point of dialogue. Consensus is not always the point of dialogue. Agreement is not always the point of dialogue. And the example she gives is, she says, sometimes I talk to my mother, and I know we're not going to agree but I can talk anyway, because it does other things. It allows us to express how we feel. It allows us to uh, get rid of uh, emotions we have. It allows us to reestablish intimacy and affection. And so, but it's not about agreement, because I know we're not going to agree. And so you might say, the language game my colleague plays with her mother is different from a scientific language game because a scientific language game is designed to arrive at truth through a scientific method. The kind of dialogue that um, my friend has with her mother is not. Or let me give you another example. You must do this. This must be a human universal. Um, I, I know it. It's the kind of thing that I, the only reason I, I even pause is it's a very intimate thing. You know, I, I mean, you must do this with your friends, right? I do this with my friends. Sometimes you start an argument with your friends just for fun, and you both know it's a game, 
And so, like, you just say something outrageous. And so, um, uh, like, um, I don't know, what, what's, a, what's a good example? Um, uh, like, uh, like uh, I don't want to use that example. Um, like a really good example. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. Like, I mean, I might be talking to your friend, and you might, you might say something like, uh, um, uh, you know, they might, they might say something jokingly like, uh, you always think you're right, don't you? You always think that you are right, don't you? And I might say back, yes, I am always right, but you can be right if you agree with me. And then, and then the game is on, right? And then there's like, uh, and then there's like, well, you know, I, I remember times you've been wrong. Like, yeah, I don't. I don't remember any times I've been wrong. Why don't you tell me a time I've been wrong? Right? I don't remember the times you've been wrong. Right? The point of this game is not consensus. Right? The point of this game is establishing friendship, intimacy. Really not establishing, enforcing it through the game. I mean, a part. Of, I think part of the reason we do this is. Um, that you play a game with this with somebody you, you like or love because it proves you're really good friends. Because you wouldn't have this argument with a stranger. Right? I wouldn't say to a stranger, I'm always right about everything. I would only say that to a friend who knew what I was joking. Right? Or uh, my daughter says this, she's a teenager, and so I don't know if this is true, but my daughter says, uh, boys uh, say insults to their friends and don't mean them. Girls give compliments to their friends and don't mean them. I have no idea whether that's true. But that's what my daughter says about teenage boys and girls. She says, boys, I think it's true of teenage boys. Having been a teenage boy, that's true. She says, teenage boys insult their friends and don't mean it. But that's how you know they're your friend. You say things like, you know, oh, your hair sucks, dude. Oh, your hair is so ugly today. And it's like, yeah, well, at least it's not in my face, like you. It's like, oh, man. Like, and it's, you know, you just joke like, and it's just, but you do it because you're showing we're such good friends, I know you don't mean this, and you know I don't mean it either. So it's a language game, and the point of the game isn't truth, right? The point of the game is just to establish and reinforce we're friends. We're such good friends, I can tease you. I can make a joke, and it's not going to hurt your feelings, because you know I'm joking. I know you're joking. So language games are heteromorphous. They're different kinds. Sometimes you want truth. Sometimes you want to know what you ought to do. Sometimes you are expressing affection through a language game and it's not deemed to truth. So a recognition of the heteromorphous nature of language games is a first step in that direction, in coming up with a notion of justice that does not depend on consensus. This obviously implies a renunciation of terror, which assumes that they are isomorphic. Isomorphic, opposite of heteromorphic. In other words, assumes they're of the same kind and tries to make them so. What is terror? Quoted this last time. By terror, I mean the efficiency gained by eliminating or threatening to eliminate a player from the language game when shared with him. He is silenced or consents not because he has been reputed, but because his ability to participate has been threatened. There are many ways to prevent someone from playing. The decision maker's arrogance, which in principle has no equivalent in the sciences, consists in the exercise of terror. It says, adapt your aspiration to our ends or else. So terror is when, so in contrast, if you recognize language games are fundamentally different in kind. We have to respect the rules of each game. We can't force people to play by the rules of our game. And if we're playing a game, we can't make someone shut up. Be play. Can't say shut up right. by any kind of threat. We can't say shut up or you're not our friend anymore. Shut up or you're fired. Shut up or we won't publish your book. Shut up, or we won't publish your article. Leonard says that's all terror. Two, the second step is the principle that any consensus on the rules defining a game and the moves playable within it must be local. In other words, agreed on by its present players 
and subject to eventual cancellation. Cancellation means that you agree on the rules now, but later you can always say, you know what, let's change the rule. We're going to drop this rule, we're going to add that rule. So, any consensus on the rules to find a game has to be local. It's based on the people playing the game, not some outside force telling them what the rules are going to be. Third, the function of the differential or imaginative or paralogical activity of the current pragmatics of science is to point out these meta-prescriptives, science's presuppositions, and to petition the players to accept different ones. The only legitimation that can make this kind of request admissible is that it will generate ideas, in other words, new statements. So what you're doing is you're coming up with new moves, new presuppositions, new meanings for terms, new kinds of arguments. And the justification is it will generate new ideas and new statements. So the Lantar conception of justice in summary, it's wrong to silence anybody who fears. The rules of the language game can only be justified by the free consensus of the participants in that game. And the goal of discussion is paralogy, the invention of new language games. Then, Leotard critiques Habermas. He's got a brief critique of Habermas in the introduction. You can find those up here. He says, it seems neither possible nor even prudent to follow Habermas. Jürgen Habermas, very influential, very important. Uh, 20th, and I think he's still alive, 21st century German philosopher, to follow Habermas in orienting our treatment of the problem of legitimation in the direction of the search for universal consensus through what he calls discourse. In other words, a dialogue of argumentation. So Habermas's basic idea is he agrees with Leotard about a lot. He agrees with Leotard that, look, there's nothing that's intuitive in the way Russell thought things were into it. Russell thinks some things are so obvious, everybody who's not crazy can see they're true. Habermas and Leotard agree. No, nothing's intuitive that way. And Habermas and Leotard agree, you can't use terror to stop violence. You can't force people to not talk by threatening them and by making them afraid. But Habermas says the goal of rational dialogue is is consensus achieved through rational, free, rational, unforced discussion. So the goal is to argue and try to reach an agreement. An agreement that we agree on, in which you are not silenced by terror, and which we argue honestly and rationally with each other. But, Leopard says, Habermas's approach would be to make two assumptions. The first is that it's possible for all speakers to come to agreement on which rules or meta-prescriptions are universally valid for language games when it is clear that language games are heteromorphous, subject to heterogeneous sets of pragmatic rules. In other words, for example, when my friend is talking to her mother, she's not trying to arrive at a consensus. She's something else. She's, she is um, getting, she's expressing the way she feels. Or when you tease your friends, when you play with your friends by having a pretend argument. You're not trying to reach an agreement, you're playing a different kind of language game. Or if you are um, you know, talking about religion, religion isn't the same as science, they have different rules. And so you shouldn't use science language game to criticize a religious language game. The second assumption is that the goal of dialogue is consensus. But as I have shown in the analysis of the pragmatics of science, consensus is only a particular state of discussion not its end. Its end, on the contrary, is parabola. So, first objection is that uh, Leotard says of Habermas, Habermas acts like all language is playing the same game, which is the game of trying to arrive at truth through rational argument. The second objection is that Habermas assumes that all language is aimed at a region consensus, and Leotard says, no, the end of discussion is always parabola invention of new ideas, new truths, new form of argumentation. Now, so far, 
I've been trying to give the best case I can give for Leotard. Why? Because part of the way I do philosophy um, is I think it's an important aspect of doing philosophy that you try to sympathetically understand whoever you're studying. So you try to give them the best possible interpretation you can. And so to make the best sense of it. So I try really hard to understand whoever I'm studying, and I try to make them make as much sense as I can. But then you have to think critically. So what are some problems that I at least think you might let the Leotard might have? Well, why is paralogy valuable as an end or goal? Leopard says the end of discussion isn't consensus, it's paralogy. Why? What's so good about paralogy? We say, oh, well, consensus, why would you think that's the goal? Why would I think paralogy is the goal? If I'm going to be skeptical about consensus as a goal, why wouldn't I be skeptical about paralogy as a goal? Now, I think maybe the reason that Leotard thinks paralogy is the goal is doesn't Leotard assume a version of the emancipatory meta-narrative in explaining the importance of consensus on rules? So Leotard doesn't say the goal of dialogue is consensus, but he says in order for rules to be justified, they have to be justified because the people agree to them. Why? Why are rules only justified if the people playing the language game agree to them? Doesn't that just assume the emancipatory meta which is that freedom is better than not being free? And you'll be more free if you choose your own rules than if you don't. Isn't Leotard's view of the heterogeneity of language game vulnerable to Plato's anti relativist argument? So remember, Plato's got this famous argument in the Theaetetus against relativism. Plato says, well, what if we ask whether relativism is relativistic? So you get a paradox. So Leotard says, well, look, there's just a heterogeneity of language games. You can't judge different language games by the same language game. But wait a second. In saying there's a heterogeneity of language games, you just use the language your own language game, to make a statement about all the other language games. Aren't you using a language game to judge all the other language games? I thought that's what you told us we're not supposed to do. Our language games, and, I, and this is perhaps I mean, one of the most important ones, well, I think they're all important, personally, but our language games or paradigms as incommensurable as Leotard or Kuhn's text. Because a lot depends on this. A lot depends on this last one. So there are clearly, I think, clearly are different language games. Wittgenstein's got to be right about that. If I say close the door, I'm not doing the same kind of thing as I am if I say the door is closed. The door is closed is a statement, true or false. Close the door is a command and a it's a that's right. Um, in a sense, Aristotle and Newton are playing different language games. That's right. Because why? The rules of what you can say when you're doing Aristotelian physics and the rules of what you can say when you're doing Newtonian physics are very different. But how different are these language games or these paradigms? Are they so different? that we really can't have a constructive dialogue? Or is there enough overlap that we still can have a constructive dialogue? If they're radically different, then no, there's dialogue is hopeless. But if there's a lot of overlap, then we could. That is part of the issue that Donald Davidson, in his article on the very idea of a conceptual scheme, which we'll be looking at next week, we'll be discussing. And Davidson is going to argue that languages actually can't be incommensurable. Davidson's going to say that they can't actually be incommensurable. It's impossible. 
we can't conceive of how languages could be incommensurable. And if that's right, then whatever else Kuhn and Rantard say, it might undermine modernism, it might undermine modernism, but it would get us to postmodernism. It would get us something else. One last thing Rantard says that I think is very interesting, and it was very, he said this around, the, the original French version of this book came out in 72. Um, we saw that the English translation was in the 80s, but the original French version was in 1972. And I was alive in 72. We had computers in 1972. Computers in 1972 were these huge, boxy things that took up an entire room. And they had these big reel-to-reel uh, -reel tapes on them, which were the memory. And so things that you think of or I think of as a computer today, that wasn't a computer back then. You know, a computer would be in a room this size. And it would give off so much heat that you would need air conditioners running all the time just to keep it from melting. You know, that's what a computer was. It had these big, like I say, real to real tapes. And that's what the memory was for. They were big, they were bulky, they were slow. And a room-sized computer had about as much power as, as a, a computerized watch does today. Literally, the computing power of a room-sized computer was about as good as a, a digital watch in terms of computer power. Um, so they were very, they were very uh, unadvanced compared to today. So this is a very forward-looking thing that Leotard said. Leotard says, we're finally in a position to understand how the computerization of society affects this problem now. It could, the computerization of society, could become the dream instrument for controlling and regulating the market system extended to include knowledge itself and governed exclusively by the performativity principle. In this case, it would inevitably involve the use of terror. So on the one hand, he says, computers could be the ultimate tool for controlling people. Why? You can store an unlimited amount of information in computers. I can remember what you read, what books you took out of the library, where you lived, who you made phone calls to, where you've driven in your car, um, everything you've ever posted on the internet, all can be regulated by computers. So Lantar says the computer could be a useful tool of terror. But it could also aid groups discussing metaprescriptives, the presuppositions of society, things like that, by supplying them with the information they usually lack for making knowledgeable decisions. The line to follow for computerization to take the second of these two paths, the path in which computerization is the tool of neurology, is in principle quite simple. Give the public free access to the memory and data banks. Now, memory and data banks, nobody uses that phrase anymore. That's what, in the 70s. It just means the computer memory. You know, give people free access to the computerized information, make it available to them. And then, the computers become a tool for freedom. In other words, give the public free access to the memory and data banks. That's what the internet does. From the internet, it's fully available, you have all the data in the world, from anywhere in the world. Internet equals free access to information, equals freedom to argue as much as you will and about what you will. And all of this can be true as long as access to the internet itself is free. So Leotard had a very forward-looking idea. He said, you know, and people, and, and, and I remember this time, I mean, they said, oh, you know, 72 is what came out, only about 10 or so. But I remember the general atmosphere Computers were invented, uh, the first one was invented in the U.S. right, in, right after World War II. ENIAC is the first one. People know that ENIAC is the first computer. Yeah, you know that. ENIAC, some of you some are not here. ENIAC is the first computer. It's now at the Smithsonian, which is a famous uh, museum in the U.S. Um, and uh, in Chinese, you say computer bug. It's sort of like a glitch in a computer, you call it bug. B-U-G. Bug again. So, do you know why I call it a bug? 
in the first computer, a bug, a moth, actually got inside the computer and caused a problem. And so in the future, since then, you have a computer problem called the bug in English. And so the, 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 the first event of computers, very quickly, people realized, wow, computers are really neat. They're really important. They're really interesting. But a lot of people became very concerned, and there were many movies and uh, television shows and science fiction films about computers taking over the world. Because people were afraid of you think of what? Matrix. Matrix, yeah, Matrix. But even earlier, things like 2001, A Space Odyssey. Yeah, 2001, A Space Odyssey by Stanley Kubrick is a classic film in this genre. And you should watch this movie. It's, it's slow moving, but it's slow moving, but it's really good. And the scene, if nothing else, get the scene where they have a problem with the onboard computer. It's like a 20 minute scene. It's brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. So, and the computer on the, the, the ship in the movie 2001 is called HAP, which is an acronym for something. Each letter stands for something. And how, if we go take the letter after each of these letters, A K L, the letter after A is I, the letter, letter after A in the alphabet is B, the after, letter after L is M, I E M, which was the major computer company in the United States in the 1960s and 70s. So that may be an accident. And so there's a really, there's a one, I'll tell you, there's a wonderful, it's just so good. It's just classic. You get 20 minutes. Just ask somebody, you know, just take the thing out and just skip ahead until, you know, one of the astronauts dies. And then just start watching. You just, you know, trust me, it's going to be like, oh my God, it's great. The whole movie's worth it just for that thing. I love it. I'm going to go watch it. No, I can't watch it. Um, but it's great. But so, and part of it, so that, I mean, I'm not giving anything away. They're going to have a problem with it. Computer, right? And so, but part of what that was expressing was this fear. There's this tool that's so powerful, but what if it's dangerous? And so, Leotard isn't unusual in saying, you know, computers might turn out to be dangerous. They could be tools of, which people could use to control us. Or, you know, they could be tools of government control. But he had this really great idea, which he says, for one thing, it would keep computers from being bad for people would be if everybody had access to it. Then they're not the enemy of freedom anymore. Now they're the tool of freedom. So make sure that everybody has access to the memory and data banks. And that's exactly what the internet does. It gives me access to everything. And so you get to have free access to information, which gives you freedom to argue as much as you will and about what you will, which is Kant's basic principle. How that can happen as long as the internet itself is accessible. Thank you very much. Next time we'll talk about quantum data science. I'll, I'll post a, a writing assignment for in like tomorrow, maybe the day after tomorrow. But it'll be up on the QQ.